Um, so today, I, tonight, I'm going to um, take you on a little journey um, and talk about something a little bit different, I think, in terms of our gardening focus. And that is going to be to really uh, bring us in on how our gardens can do a lot more support for birds. Um, I do want to acknowledge at the beginning uh, that all of the bird photographs are actually of my partner, Gregor Beck. Um, so I absolutely have to thank him for having supplied those to me. Uh, the plants are more my own photographs. And why are we not moving forward here? Come on. Okay, something, all right, I'm gonna hope this works. Um, some of the buttons seem to have frozen up a little bit here. Okay, um, I'd like to start actually by saying, um, we're gonna talk about birds, but to be perfectly honest, um, anything we do in garden design really benefits a whole raft of species. Most of the focus in the talk that I've noted in past years, and it's just tremendous to see this change start to take place, is that we have a bigger, and much uh, more encompassing focus on pollinators. Uh, butterflies seem to get a lot of the attention, but increasingly we're concerned and rightfully so for the fate of our native bee species um, and other insects in the garden. And as much as um, we often enjoy birds in the garden, it's typically at a feeder and not really thinking about when it comes to the design of a garden, having the birds sort of upfront and in mind. And I just like to go and think about all the things we do for birds that are also gonna be tremendously beneficial to other species. I love using this picture because we're gonna talk a little bit about spicebush tonight as one species of shrub that is just tremendously attractive in migration to birds, but it also benefits others like the spicebush silk moth. And as some of you have, I've talked to before about this, I like to say your nature nugget for the evening is that this is a pair of spicebush silk moths that um, were in our garden a number of years ago, only a few years after having put spicebush right into the garden. The, um, you can kind of tell what's going on. I think this is an adult audience, um, but the female has just emerged from her cocoon and the male is actually already mating with her. And I got very curious about this because they're attracted by pheromones and just how wonderful it is to have native plants in the garden and see what really else will come to your garden. These males apparently can detect a female up to 37 kilometers away based on the pheromones that she releases. So it doesn't take long for them to find them. And of course in nature, that's key to making sure the species continues to go forward. So I'm going to start by letting you know how biased I am in a way. You saw the, through the introduction that I'm clearly very interested in my whole career about conservation, and in particular about our native systems, our habitats, and our species. So after spending a lot of time in conservation and um, continue to be, be very involved in some organizations, um, back in about 15 years ago, uh, I decided to make a little change. And that was that I wanted to do more to promote the conservation of plants, to bring more excitement to people about the world of plants. And as a result, we began a little project called South Coast Gardens. So this is where it looked like 16 years ago, I guess now, almost to the day, because it was the first week in October. So just missing it. It was a field we acquired across the road you can see it was basically a mowed field and um, the equipment arrived to begin building a greenhouse, which was the only structure put on it. How's it going? That's the same view today. Uh, I took that last evening. Uh, it's a little blurry because we had a mist coming in after the uh, rain left. Um, and you can see the top of a greenhouse in the distance, but my focus has been to really build a collection of plants to educate people about the great roles they play in our systems and hopefully to really keep things uh, moving forward in building an ethic around conservation that we all need to do more about if we're going to really do well by this planet. 
And I'm just going to quickly take you through a couple of things. So quite off the start, um, I'm not a huge fan of big lawns. Uh, biologically, they're kind of I, a one step above a desert, shall we say. And so we've been doing a lot to really suppress and transition these areas. And you can do it in a number of ways. And I'm putting these up front because I want to encourage people that it is possible to really transition an area of lawn quite quickly into something that is a great benefit to both pollinators, birds, and other wildlife for that matter. So you can tarp it. Um, you can get more aggressive as we did a month ago and get a sod buster in if you're doing large areas. This was a new area we're doing that's about 2,500 new square feet of lawn removed that's going to be replaced by a garden for wildlife. Um, at times we've tarped it and then actually re turned over the soil. We like to encourage people not to take all that good organic matter at the top away. Um, if you do use a sod cutter and remove the sod, we usually pile it up and bring it back to the site a couple of years later. This is another example too, I'd like to put up quickly that even if you've got a lot of shade because you have a lot of trees, there is still a nice direction you can go with this. And I just am going to take you here because this is part of the transition. So one year ago and a month was beginning of August, we began working on a 7,500 square feet of lawn being taken out at an historic home. And I want you to look at the back fence behind the two guys in the blue shirts um, and pretend you're looking from the fence over and watching them work. One year later, if you happen to close your eyes, this is now what it looks like. This is a complete transition. We put in over uh, 1, 125 species of plants. 80, 70 to 80 percent of them native to the area and 90 percent of them native to our region. The overnight change at this location in the number of insects, pollinators and birds has really been tremendous and um, we've really enjoyed seeing this begin to evolve and it's only in its first year one year later. Um, depending what angle you look at, it's full of color and one of the things I like to use this example for is that a lot of um, people we initially talk about kind of this big bold move is that well it's going to look like a really big unkempt weed patch and I think most people who have visited this garden see the tremendous diversity color and design elements that went into it and it is much more a garden it's not an abandoned lot it's not something that uh, you would just see by the roadside there is purpose to it there is uh, texture and color and all those things that make up a garden. Because one of the things we wanna talk about tonight is we are talking about gardens. We obviously do other work to restore large natural areas. That's been so key to my career for most of my life, but we are talking tonight about smaller scale backyard gardens. And whether or not you've got fruit trees that may not be native, knowing that I'm talking to naps tonight, but that you're growing for food, you can still fill in underneath with other plants and all spaces can really be created, even if it's a much more uh, backing onto a more natural area, you can blend and match that with it. And there is a bird in this picture at the bottom, but it's actually a bronze bird. So we're not gonna count that one yet. Okay, so I wanna talk first of all about the importance of doing this uh, gardening at the home garden level and the actual impact it will have for birds. And tonight we're going to talk about sort of three groups or I wanna mention the importance of them to three groups. One is birds that are going to be breeding in the summer season and or, and it includes resident birds that may be there year round. So these are species that will either fly north to our area, uh, whether wherever you live, um, and, and or birds that may reside there year round like the Northern Cardinal here, and, um, and, and actually look for kinds of habitat suitable to breeding. The other benefit gardens can bring are for wintering birds that really breed in more northern latitudes and then come down and spend the winter here. So the sparrows in that top uh, feeder picture are uh, tree sparrows that breed typically in the far northern uh, boreal forest and lower Arctic. And those birds actually winter here in southern Ontario. And then there's a large group of species that are our migratory birds. So in both spring and fall migration, 
These birds may be breeding further north, whether it's in the Algonquin area, for example, if you're sitting in southern Ontario, or the broad boreal, or even the Arctic, and they pass through twice a year. And that is a tremendous journey. Many of them are neotropical migrants going all the way to Central and South America. So they really have to maintain um, a good fuel load to make that journey, and our home gardens can play a critical role there. So those are all important groups of birds that all can benefit when we do well in our garden for uh, establishing plants that they're gonna be interested in. There's one bird I do wanna mention and I do get uh, such a kick out of this that doesn't really rely on our gardens that much, um, but it is also the only bird that is almost entirely, entirely dependent on us for providing nesting sites. And that is the purple martin. They have evolved um, to be almost entirely dependent on breeding in birdhouses. And uh, obviously they feed in nature, but this is one for other than setting one of these large uh, inappropriate place uh, martin houses up, there's not a lot our gardens directly can do for them. Very interesting transition. Okay, the benefits of gardens are really critical. And I'm gonna start here by just giving this slide that shows what a migration, what a bird movement looks like through the year. So this is for one of our many warblers, these colorful little birds that come through with great song in the spring, and then they come back through in the fall, they're doing so right now. And the areas on this map in green are the areas in Eastern North America where these birds pass through. The blue area down in the Southern parts of Mexico and uh, Central America are where the bird actually spends its winter. The red up primarily in the boreal forest and the highest elevations of the Appalachians are where it actually resides for the summer. So these are birds that are passing through and as they move southward or they move northward in the spring, when they encounter large urban cities and landscapes, um, those are pretty foreign and challenging landscapes for them. An ability for a bird to stop overnight in the event that it gets grounded in bad weather or that it's just a little bit tired and got as far as it can go, it's really important that they can stop and find habitats that are going to allow them to rest, maintain their fat reserves, feed, and maybe build them up a little bit to get to that next leg, but not end up in a sort of concrete jungle where they're really disoriented and not able to really relax and they use up a lot of the energy needed to maintain that migration um, route. So gardens can play such a critical role in residential and urban areas uh, in enabling these species to have that 24, 48 hour stopover that really enables them to carry on till they get to the habitat they actually require. So really, really important. So that's just a couple of examples of why gardening for birds is something we should be thinking about. Getting the species in there that are really going to be beneficial to them, uh, that are going to provide as well, as I'll be talking about, the sort of insect fauna that are attracted to them that are important for many of those birds as well. It's not just the things that they eat in the way of berries or seeds, uh, but it's also in what other wildlife we can attract to our garden that will be beneficial to them. So a little bit on plant selection, what is appropriate? Um, I think everyone who's gonna be gathered here tonight is pretty um, uh, supportive of making sure we use native species whenever possible, and preferably those species that are actually growing in your local area. It's really important too that you do the research so that the plants that are selected match the site conditions or their, the habitats in which they naturally occur match the site conditions that is your yard. And it is important to recognize that many of our urban properties aren't quite the same as the immediate adjacent areas I like to remind people that typically in most of our residential areas, we are drier because we do everything we can in settled areas to lower the water table, get rid of the water as quickly as we can. And one of the challenges I find is that people will think that what they see in the adjacent ravine might do well in their yard. And it might, but there are things we have to do to ensure that happens in terms of maybe some supplemental watering and things like that. Otherwise you need to really kind of get a sense of what those conditions are and match them up. So from an eco-regional perspective, 
Um, the red arrows here for us in Southern Ontario kind of to me show the area we should be thinking about in terms of where plant selection comes from. And you'll notice it's, it slides over into the Northern US a little bit or quite a bit. Um, I raised this because this is a mapping we did of North America when I was with World Wildlife Fund as part of a continental uh, mapping of ecoregions, which is now used as a pretty fundamental baseline under uh, much of the way we think about how to organize systems. And I get a little um, challenged sometimes to accept when people want to plant something simply because it's an Ontario native and they live in Ontario. Ontario crosses many ecological regions, and we really should be transitioning ourselves to think like Mother Nature, which is really what are the ecoregional contexts we're gardening in, not what province or what state we're gardening in. Um, it tends to work a little bit better in the US just because their states often are quite a bit smaller, so there's less variation. But in Canada, with big, big provinces for the most part, it does become a bit of an issue. So gardening really needs to feel uh, and focus on sort of that ecoregional context. So Birds Canada, which is an organization many of you know and is national in scope and works on conservation and scientific research around our birds uh, species in this country, um, really began developing a program a couple of years ago thinking about it. So uh, my partner was involved, Gregor Beck, with the photos. Uh, and a, a, a big team in the end, uh, Natasha Barlow was a key player in all of this. And they began thinking, okay, so we need to be thinking about how we do bird conservation and reach out to more people. So can we get birders more interested in gardening? And maybe can we get gardeners more interested in birding? And maybe that's a great happy coincidence because they're again, it's been so successful in thinking about what we can do with pollinators that let's take it that step to the bird world and see how we can do there. So a program was born, which is called Gardening for Birds and the website that has the materials for which have, uh, and the resources by how you can find more information on much of what I'll be talking about tonight is there, birdgardens.ca. And that map I showed you was then used as an underlay to develop a really interesting tool. So we again took that ecoregional approach, but combined it with what we know about bird regions in the country and overlaid the two so that we have a marriage between regions that are meaningful to both plants and birds. And we sort of called these our new bird regions of which uh, you can see them spread across the country here. And as a result, once you know what bird region you're in, they developed um, with assistance from uh, some of us in the plant sector to actually come up with a means for, to help people plant, uh, select the native plants that might best suit their home conditions. And it's really, um, I can't even begin to get into all of it here and won't, but it talks of there are resources here about planting your garden. Um, there's the plant selector feature, which I'll show you just a couple of slides on. Uh, featured birds, if you want to learn a little bit more about that, and there are other resources with uh, some videos and fact sheets and so forth. So it's quite comprehensive. And this is just an example of the plant selector. On the left, you can see, you can click on your bird garden zone. And if you don't know or aren't good with a map, you can punch in your postal code and you'll, it'll tell you which zone you're in. And then you begin answering some questions about, are you planting in a sunny area? What kind of soil? All of this and up will pop increasingly a list of plants that would be suitable for you, for your region, um, and hopefully be those that you can create a list with and take to a nursery and begin getting your garden designed. And it will also talk about for all of those species, give an indication of what groups of birds might be attracted to them. And, and uh, so, so there's a lot of work there um, and a lot of fun to be had on a Saturday evening with a coffee in hand and go through that and pick out your birds. Selecting native plants, one thing that I always try to put in my talks, because I'm always promoting native plants in my talks, and this is a little um, obvious for you guys, but I do want to raise it. Uh, because as someone who's been advocating for the use of native plants um, all his life, all my life, um, I do see 
I, I try to make sure that the conservation ethic that supports that use of native plants really gets installed in people. And there are a few things I found that kind of get thrown around a bit loose. And these are three points I do want to raise. One is always said that native plants are easier to grow, better adapted to regional conditions, and lower maintenance than non-native plants. And the reason I'm raising these is, is that this is true in a lot of natural areas where they are well suited, but in gardens, it isn't always the case. You have to be able to match the kind of conditions you have, as I mentioned earlier, with the right native plant. And partly this, I've seen people get excited about native plants, go, oh, all I have to do is that no matter what I put in, they're gonna do well. And then they get discouraged because they don't do well. And it's all about encouraging people. So this is why I like to raise it, that we need to be clear. If you take a trillium, our provincial, uh, not a provincial flower, but a flower we think is our provincial flower, um, and put it in a harsh environment with lots of full sun, it's not gonna survive. It's a native plant, it's not gonna do well. It is important like any group of plants that we clearly think about the right plants for the right site and don't get people's expectation. Anything native is gonna work well there. The other one I get a kick out of is that plants always behave the same way in the garden as they do in nature. Well, no, they don't. Some become quite aggressive. Others grow in very different sizes. I remember designing a garden for one gentleman and I used heath aster because he had a very hot, dry corner and heath aster is normally quite a reasonably diminutive uh, little aster. Um, he called me three months later to say, I don't know what you planted, but I've got something that's six feet high blocking my window. And when I went and chatted with him, well, he had fed his heath asters like he did other potted plants all summer long, watered it whenever it barely looked dry. So this heath aster that's adapted normally to very dry conditions was suddenly put in probably uh, the best conditions it could possibly imagine. And it went from being a typically one and a half foot tall plant to six feet. So they don't always behave the same in a garden because people do things a little differently there. The last one is it's wild looking, so it must be native. There are a number of challenges here in people who, who basically have the equivalent of an abandoned lot full of weeds and wanna call it native because they're lazy and don't wanna do anything. Native gardening is spectacular, it's beautiful, and people need to know what's in that garden. Yes, it will look a little different than maybe your typical uh, round cut garden with um, rows of geraniums, but it isn't an abandoned lot full of exotic invasive uh, weeds that people are trying to claim as native. They do, that look does a lot of disservice. Native gardens can be as spectacular, beautiful, and nicely designed as any group of plants. So those are three things I always say to start off. I hope, um, I hope it resonates. We need to encourage people to build that ethic and we need to be honest about setting them up that native plants like any group of plants, some can be aggressive, some can be hard to grow. And just because it looks wild doesn't mean it is, it could be an exotic. Okay, let's get into birds. Wildlife really responds, whether it's birds, insects, or uh, other groups of species, not just uh, to individual species, but really to the broader uh, whole community of plants that are there. And I like saying, let's take a bird's eye view from above. I mean, the importance of creating structure, diversity, and real cohesion within a garden plant community. If we're planting something that's more of a prairie garden, let's really understand how that might work. If we're doing a shade garden that's more reminiscent of a forest. Let's really make that work so it's got the same kind of structural elements. And supplementing the garden with plants and habitat elements that might be in short supply in the neighborhood. This is really important. People often garden just based on what they want to do in their backyard. They don't really look around the context that their garden is sitting in. So I always encourage people that if you're thinking from a bird's eye view, you're going to be looking at a whole neighborhood area. What's already there? What can you add as part of that jigsaw? that's new and different and additive to what other people may have done. I'm not encouraging people to go out and creep their neighbor's gardens in a kind of sneaky way, but do take stock of other trees that are there. Can you add and build to that diversity? Are there a lot of gardens with mature trees, but nowhere are there good shrub rows with uh, things that will be fruiting for fall migration? Are there few patches with a lot of prairie plants or uh, native grasses that might provide something for another group. So kind of look at that and see if there's something you can do 
to build that bigger hole by uh, when you garden your own backyard. And food and water, of course, for anything, really it's important that we think about how do we do this across all seasons and really add as much diversity as the space will allow. Here's cedar waxwing and eastern bluebird, uh, two uh, beautiful birds in our eastern North America area that absolutely would love a garden with these four species. Because on the upper left, you have uh, service berries, um, which not only flower in the spring, um, which are great for attracting insects and uh, therefore supply kind of a bit of food for some of the uh, warblers that move through, but in the sort of June, early July, you'll get berries, which the cedar waxwings in particularly really like. If you're out in a little bit more of the country setting, the bluebirds will as well. And then as you go below that into July, you've got choke cherry, which bring in berries for July by mid to late August. If you have the uh, number of bushy dogwoods, you get the dogwood berries. Again, continuing that supply of food, those, both those birds eat a lot of berries. And then if you have the native mountain ash, which is a little uh, at the southern edge of the range for this zone, um, they really supply some of the berries that will go through late fall and into winter. Uh, we have found bluebirds absolutely adore these mountain ash berries through the early to midwinter season. So combining these into a back hedgerow along a back fence would really provide four species that would give quite a continuous array of, uh, of uh, fruit for those birds that eat berries. And cedar waxwings, another great and overlooked native tree is eastern red cedar with the blueberries. Um, it's hard to see in this picture, but I think we've counted 11 waxwings all feeding tucked in here on an early winter day, uh, really going after those nice blueberries. And I just have to emphasize that some of these native dogwoods as medium-sized shrubs are really nice. We use a lot of shrubs in a backyard or front yard landscape, uh, especially as a backdrop often. Um, some of these native ones do two things. They provide, actually they do many things, but two of the things they do are provide great flowers for insect pollinators in the spring and any of the insectivore bore birds that are around might pick a few of them off, but it's great for building your uh, insect and pollinator uh, garden. And then of course, this is obviously not a garden. Well, not obviously, it could be, but it's actually a hedgerow just behind us, uh, full of gray dogwood. And you can see the abundance of fruit, just spectacular. And that can be stripped away at this time of year within three or four nights when the migrating warbler are moving through. They move from eating insects in the summer to eating fruit for the most part on their southern migration. And other birds, really move into these two. The fat reserves in these berries are really quite um, helpful in maintaining and building the reserves they need to make those long distance migrations. So things like red-eyed vireo and remarkably Eastern kingbird, birds that we associate in the summer strictly as eating insects because they need that dietary change to help also feed their young because the calcium in the insects helps build the bone structure in the developing young birds. But then in migration, they switch over. And king birds, if you have these beautiful pagoda dogwoods, or alternate leaf dogwood, another common name for them, um, if you have these in your garden and they develop those beautiful blue-black berries at the end of the season, king birds will often descend and absolutely clean that bush off. And I've seen this in very residential areas in fairly large cities. This isn't just a rural thing that happens. They find these and they hone in on them. It's really quite wonderful and a great structural addition. It's got great architecture as a shrub and has a, a nice uh, opportunity to fill a nice corner in the back garden. Now, this is a bit of a wilder thing I want to talk about. And these are for species that, uh, bird species that really go after fruit. Wild grape, this was taken two nights ago on our fence at the west side of our gardens where we let some of these um, vines grow. We try to control them elsewhere a little bit because they are aggressive and will obviously take over many other things. But the abundance of fruit this year is astonishing. Um, this looks more like a vineyard picture than it does a wild grape. These grapes, about half we find get eaten in the fall migration 
And then others that dry up are used all winter long by other birds that are looking for those sort of small fruited plants and are completely cleaned off by spring. And this is just an example. This is a catbird that lingered a little too long into the early winter a few years ago. And this is um, a bittersweet, our American, not the invasive bittersweet. Uh, and it really, again, this is a, if you've got the room for it and you have the native species, this is a wonderful wildlife plant for uh, birds that want that winter food. Now, some of the berries um, are not quite as droopy uh, as a drooper berry. This is a uh, uh, sumac, and this is a catbird feeding on sumac, and I put in brackets May. One of the things about all season is that spring is often quite uh, challenging time for some of these species because a lot of the fruit hasn't yet developed. You can see the branches behind are just budding and the blurry part, but the leftover sumac is still really fulfilling what this bird needs having just arrived from further south. Uh, probably pretty hungry and getting ready to set up territory and nest. So maintaining and not deadheading everything and make, making sure there are shrubs within the garden uh, complex that um, can do this sort of service is really helpful to attracting those birds. Now I put this up because this is often how we think of and see uh, many of the bigger seed eaters. Um, there are definitely the woodpeckers, blue jays, more in nature would go for an assembly like this of acorns, hickories, sort of different sized nuts. And my biggest education on blue jays and how they move them, and if you've ever had the opportunity to watch blue jays gorge themselves at a feeder, or even better, in an oak forest, they have a throat pouch that they fill up quite full, almost like a hamster, um, and then fly away and will make caches all over the place. So our gardens right now, despite my due diligence in having planted a number of oaks um, when we first started gardening the property to build up some forest cover, um, have a lot more oak coming now because we see caches of small groupings of these. And the oak, nearest mature oaks are far too far for a chipmunk or a squirrel to move. So these are definitely blue jays and we've actually witnessed them caching them in the ground. It's absolutely fascinating. Great dispersal mechanism, but this is part of their di natural diet. So having oaks, hickories in the landscape for these types of species are really, really beneficial. And this is obviously a longer term planning because we're here talking about trees that will take a while to mature, but part of the evolving garden, I like to call it, is that we may want to plan for future benefits of species as well. And these are just obviously some of the um, species of uh, caria or hickories that are suitable for Southern Ontario. The Northern pecan we put in there because that is a little bit more in the sort of US component of the range we're in, um, but it is a caria species and uh, does well. And just, a, I think, a, aside from bird benefits, the aesthetics of things like shagbark hickory are just wonderful. Oaks as well, here's a big list of oaks. And again, scarlet and shingle oak are more typical of the Southern portions of the eco region we find ourselves in here in Southern Ontario. They range very, very close. So they're near native to Ontario into Michigan um, and adjacent New York and Pennsylvania. Uh, but this is quite a range of oaks and there are white oaks and black oak groups. Uh, both are uh, palatable to these uh, uh, bird species like woodpeckers and jays uh, that require them. And the caution I just have on long-term planning with oat wilk, and it's a bit depressing, but hopefully we can somehow manage it, is the new, that's not a new disease, but the disease is newly on our doorstep of oak wilt, which is uh, fairly devastating. And I won't go into it in detail tonight, but if you aren't aware of this yet, do look into it. And we need to be vigilant about um, watching for this in Southern Ontario. It could be unfortunately a fairly big hit on our oak forests and species. Um, so for long-term planning, we need to take maybe this into account a little bit. Okay, there are a lot of birds that love to eat small to medium-sized seeds. So, and that includes seeds that are produced uh, by our native grasses, uh, big groups of things like asters and goldenrods, our brown-eyed Susans, coneflowers, ironweed. Uh, we'll get into this a little bit later, but having those kinds of perennial um, 
elements to a garden really make a difference, provided that you're not deadheading them as soon as they finish flowering. Because of course, one of the things I like to say is when we build a beautiful garden for pollinators, we're building it for the birds. The pollinators may be what we focus on in the summer, but as those plants go to seed, that's when the birds are gonna move in. Our wintering sparrows, our migratory species, they're the ones that are really gonna take advantage and make use of those gardens in maybe what we would like to call the off season, but fall, late fall and winter and into early spring. And just uh, some of the species that are really going to uh, take and make benefit of that, tough to tip mouse, quite unusual, but it's becoming more common in, in our area and in the Niagara region. Northern Cardinal and tree sparrows, obviously a tray feeder. These are a tray feeders, obviously, where we put sunflower seeds and other things like that. And that should be a good cue. If they love sunflowers, then a lot of the native species of sunflower and relatives are going to be beneficial to these species in the garden. The seed head uh, formation here is uh, of, of many of the cone flowers. This is not our, uh, strictly native to most of Ontario. This is purple cone flower, it gets close. Uh, pale cone flower is the one that is uh, more widespread here in Southern Ontario, but they all have that same seed benefit. And of course, again, in summer, the butterflies enjoy the nectar. In fall and winter, the birds enjoy the seed. So think about that in planting American goldfinch on cup plant, a uh, real magnet for species like um, all of our finches that are real small seed eaters. The only caution I'll just quickly say on cup plant is if you're on a fairly moist site, it can be one of those that becomes quite aggressive. So do beware. Uh, but it is absolutely a great pollinator plant and again, a great birding plant. Birds in search of nectar. Um, this is a smaller group here in Southern Ontario, much larger in the tropics, but Baltimore Oriole will go for the nectar feeders uh, that you have for hummingbirds as well as sliced oranges, we're used to this. But what we really wanna do is be focusing on getting as many of the plants that resemble those feeders out into the gardens and being able to observe that natural feeding take place. Ruby-throated hummingbird, this would be its smorgasbord. Because if we start in the lower left, we've got the columbine for early uh, summer, uh, late, late May to early June. Um, later on in the summer, if we have bee bomb, it really comes into play. Then the cardinal flower kicks in in August, up above, with a little trepidation and in the far corner is trumpet creeper because that can be aggressive too, but really, really sought after by the hummingbirds. And then right now that's flowering the spotted jewelweed is really critical. And in fact, on the left, the columbine is critical food source for ruby throated hummingbirds in their spring migration as they're coming in and arriving. And the spotted jewelweed is one of the predominant flowers they'll visit at this time of year as they're now heading back south into Central America and Northern South America. So this little tiny bird really can benefit here all through the seasons by having this kind of collection of species um, growing or at least some of them uh, to get them through um, and supplement the food they might otherwise get at a hummingbird feeder. There's another real group of species uh, of birds, uh, the finches in particular, that feed on cone. They're very, very uh, much in, uh, dependent on a good cone supply. And in fact, there are things like the finch forecast in the birding world uh, that has traditionally been put up to predict how far south the finches will migrate based on how big the boreal and the uh, northern temperate cone crop is in our spruce, pine, and firs. So these are really important trees to incorporate if you want to attract things like this little female purple finch. And when you look at the bill, you can see how specialized it is in order to really take advantage of uh, pine cones and pulling out. There's other much more sophisticated uh, evolutionary adaptations. Just Google crossbills and you'll be amazed to see these curved crossed bills that can twist out some of the uh, seeds from pines. And again, our native white pine, a very large tree, not gonna be suitable for a lot of smaller backyards, but uh, the pine and, and, uh, or the cone crop on these white pines really uh, helpful to a lot of birds. Insectivores. So there's the other group, this is the last sort of group I'm gonna talk about quickly, is those species that really 
have a big part of their diet are insects. And it's not a coincidence that this early spring migration photo of a black-throated green warbler is in a willow that you can see flowering in the background. Pussy willows in particular, um, with big, fat, abundant flowers are really critical to a lot of our warblers. And in fact, if you wanna see nice spring warblers, plant a willow if you have a suitable site. I know they're not the most uh, uh, garden attractive plants, but if you cut them down regularly and get the nice big shoots, uh, some of which you can use for uh, spring decoration, the others you leave to go into flower, these are some of the plants that come, uh, that are able to obviously be in flower early and attract a lot of insects. So the early migrants are often in those vicinities looking for the insects that are attracted to this plant. So planting something like that can really pull in some of these birds. Okay, so those are some of the dietary things. I'm gonna go through a couple more in a few minutes, but shelter is another one from both weather and predators. A lot of gardens that we set up um, for birds uh, really need to have at least a corner or somewhere where there's a bit heavier cover, evergreens being probably conifers, I should say, being the most uh, suitable candidates for this, that will in winter weather especially provide that cover when all the foliage drops off many of the other species in our garden. So whether it's a small scale native thing like the common juniper on the left, or there's space for something a bit larger like Eastern hemlock, those are really important. And once they get a bit larger, especially if you do have a feeding station or there's areas they frequent in your yard, they need to be able to deke in to something like that if they detect danger nearby. And it's not just in winter, little species like the hummingbird again, will often be found roosting in under the cover, out of the sun, where they're a little more protected from predators, especially when you're the size of a hummingbird. Um, so these areas within the garden become vitally important as part of the complex of habitats birds will seek out and look for. Um, and of course, nesting in um, evergreens is commonly done because again, it provides good protection, but this just happens to be an example of the morning dove uh, nesting in pine. And they will do crazy things away from uh, places like this too. We've seen morning doves nest in all sorts of locations, but this seems to be one that is more natural for them. And I put this in just because part of going through the garden and discovering nests, the engineering feats of some of these birds is truly, truly remarkable. We all know about the woven hanging nests of Orioles uh, that are so remarkable. And this summer, this is an all native species. Uh, we have a little patch of bamboo, a broadleaf bamboo, and this cat bird set up a nest in the crux of a chokeberry, but the bamboo leaves folded over like a thatched roof and absolutely protected it in any of the heavy rains. It was absolutely an incredible location it sought out. So it's always nice to have a range of these areas, but it was quite thick, well protected and kind of off the beaten path. So having areas within the garden that are a little more peaceful and a little more secretive for birds can be really critical because they aren't interested in always having you bump up against them. And this is particularly true of some of what we call the skulkers, the species that are quite small, often love to <clears throat> be in and down in among big tangles of uh, brush and or thicker corners of the garden. Uh, yellowthroat would be <clears throat> one example as my throat gets dry. And of course, the white-throated sparrow is another wonderful bird in Southern Ontario migration, uh, that quintessential sort of call, probably second to the loon in what we think of as our Northern camping grounds. Uh, but they do love to skulk around in sort of thicker areas where they're protected from predators looking for primarily seed. Same with these two birds. So cardinals are quite common and abundant in many of our residential neighborhoods. But where they nest is usually going to be in an area that's a little bit uh, thicker growing, so denser brush, uh, denser plantings, uh, brown thrasher, very much a little more rural bird perhaps, but in the same context. And these birds have both bred in our garden when it was still fairly young, uh, finding really dense patches um, in order to do so. This is something I love to do. So if you have an opportunity in a natural uh, garden setting that you're building to put in a little bit of old wood. 
a bit of a log, a stump, something. Birds that typically feed around the ground love to pop up and have a look around a little bit, see if there's any danger nearby skulking. So this is something that actually adds an interesting element to, and it introduces different insects to the garden, many of which can become food for birds as well. And of course, it adds that natural landscape element. Um, and it's also beneficial. A horizontal log is a great place for butterflies to warm up in the sun uh, uh, after a cool morning, as these guys were doing just the other day, Red Admiral. This is a, an example of one of the gardens we took the sod off of earlier on, and they were left with some very big boulders uh, that had been piled up at the end of their driveway by a previous owner. So we moved them around with some heavy equipment, but got them placed, and then we filled in with native plants. So you see ginger and trilliums and common juniper in behind. This was a fairly shaded lot, partly shaded. Um, and the other thing I want to point out here is that in shade gardens, in any garden, but particularly the shade gardens, let the leaf litter lie. Um, our biggest battle with uh, lawn care companies that come to properties where we put gardens on is they want to go in to the garden we created the first year and pull all the leaf litter off, which is a little bit of a challenge because that's what's going to continue and build up that organic matter that's going to hold the moisture and really be important. And that brown thrasher, thrasher they love to go in and partly name because they scrape and make a great noise in among all this leaf litter looking for interesting bugs to uh, feed their young. Water, shelter, food, water. One of the little uh, hints about making a pond that's gonna be a little bit more attractive to birds is to always ensure that there are edges that will come down to the water where they can get a drink. If they want to bathe or if they want to do a little bit more, you need a very, very shallow end. And the other thing we often do is put sticks and logs across a smaller water feature, as you see here. It allows them to perch, bend over, and get a drink. Um, they're very nervous around water very often. The key to getting and having birds find your water feature is to have a little trickling noise sound. A lot of the migratory and forest birds rely on that auditory sense to come in and actually find the water. When I was in Toronto and had a garden there and we had a small pond, we had four or five rocks, the water tumbled. And you could see in the spring in migration, some of the warblers that were newly arriving would circle around and circle around getting closer and closer like a spinning top until they kind of honed in on where that noise was and they'd land right beside the trickling water. To them, that's the sound of a babbling stream or brook in, in the forest setting. So that auditory component can be really important. Any water feature, whether it's a bird bath or whatever though, please do make sure the water remains clean. Um, and the same with feeders. Um, I also like to put in um, this slide because one of the things that is a bit different for gardening with birds is that it is in layers. So you want that vertical structure. Some birds like to spend time up higher and then there's the medium and the lower. And all of those layers so planting things that are a bit lower to the ground, medium shrubs, and then higher is always important as well. Because a lot of birds like to sing from the treetops and they like that vanguard. The other thing about big trees is that you will also get uh, birds like the creeper who will find and feed in among the crevices. So maintaining large trees is obviously a really great thing. Um, of course, one of my favorite trees are tulip trees with a very towering, and you can see that big furrowed bark. That's where you're going to find woodpeckers and other things. Great habitat element. Hackberry being one of them. It's also called sugarberry because the fruit of hackberry is highly beneficial to migrating warblers. And you might get the benefit of an American snout butterfly, crazy looking thing that is also dependent on hackberry. So some of the garden design elements for the more open prairie uh, again, watch it. Some of those plants especially can be a bit aggressive and weedy. Uh, doesn't mean they're bad. It's just you have to be aware of that if you're trying to maintain the diversity. Uh, again, most will require a good eight hours of direct sun to thrive. They're not typically shade plants and a seasonal succession of flowers is critically important. Um, and where possible, try and maximize a bit of the uh, plant diversity. Um, also for forest woodland, uh, vertical layers, desirable trees uh, are really, really important to think about. So trees, shrubs, and understory. 
Uh, woodland plants, again, are typically more demanding of ongoing garden care, initial site preparation, getting organic matter into the soil uh, to succeed. Uh, most will demand that summer shade, organic rich soil again. And many of those plants can languish if appropriate site characteristics are not maintained. So it's not one where you can walk away as frequently from and not be a little bit engaged in maintenance. Okay, and just to wrap up, um, just a few groups of plants that are really helpful and of interest to birds. Any of the birches, now this is obviously a forest situation, but yellow birch, the seeds as they uh, develop on mature trees are highly of, uh, attractive to a lot of the small seed eaters. River birch, again, a little more near native to the south, but that bark is incredible. And you will see those little winter creepers and others crawling in among those. And the little pieces of paper birch uh, bark uh, and or river birch bark are often used as nesting material. So it's a great addition that way, just a beautiful one in the garden. Uh, one of my favorite eastern flowering dogwood, uh, our county flower of Norfolk is really important. Um, it's one of those that structurally is in the medium part of the forest uh, level. And of course it produces great fruit that's really, really important um, as well for bird migrating. You have to watch, this is a picture of dogwood anthracnose. We are a bit cautious about dogwood and anthracnose. Um, it is suitably grown in areas that are more open and sunlit now, less of a great plant for some of the shade. Watch provenance and seed source on any plant. Um, I, I use this as an example with the dogwood. The pink flowered varieties actually come from populations in uh, Virginia. So uh, not as hardy as the white flowering forms if it's local native seed, but you guys all know that. Great fall color. Sassafras, if you can get them, this is a great wildlife tree. Not only is it great for pollinators and it's got beautiful foliage, but these seeds that develop at the end of the year are absolutely critical for thrushes, migrating robins. Many of the berry eaters uh, will really relish these, these fruit and it's close relative to spice bush, the same thing. Great early spring for attracting insects. And then in the fall, right now, we've got the thrushes and others eating the seeds. Any of the maples with the maple keys, these are really uh, helpful and important trees for uh, feeding uh, many of the smaller seed eaters. I've got to put a picture of tulip tree in. Not only do the flowers provide nectar for some of the uh, species like Orioles, they're great for attracting insects for the insectivores. And in the early winter, you get many of the finches feeding on the remaining seeds in the cones that develop. And it's the same idea with the magnolia group. Um, we love magnolias for their flowers. And again, this is a native magnolia a little south of Ontario, but um, bees uh, aren't the big uh, element here because beetles are really what Magnolias are all about in terms of the bugs that come to the flowers. And you will see uh, some of these insectivores coming in and going after these beetles. They're feeding. Our native magnolia, the cucumber tree here, not one of the most uh, floral, uh, beautiful from a floral perspective, uh, but the seeds that develop, these are the seed pods developing absolutely right now. Our trees here are loaded. The great bark for the creepers and another Little again, near native magnolia, the sweet bay, but this is what all magnolia seed cones will look like with these beautiful red or pink seeds. They have a very high fat content and are again, really sought after. And it's largely how they're distributed in nature by my fall migrating songbirds. So leaving the seeds on the magnolias is a real benefit to birds in the garden. And just something I like to put up that really resembles it. This is Jack in the pulpit fruit. So this is something that, um, actually would in a forest garden work out well. Elderberries, a real magnet, um, uh, whether it doesn't really matter what species uh, you're planting, birds are gonna like them. Uh, if you're trying to get them for your own jellies and jams, then you've got to beat the birds to them, especially the black one here. Again, I mentioned earlier, the native mountain ash species. Uh, American mountain ash is the most suitable to Southern Ontario. The berries really hold into the winter and are really important for some of those early overwintering species that do like berries. All sumac species, whether it's when they're in flower and attracting insects for the insectivores, again, the fruit that is remaining, as you saw in earlier slides, critical 
to get many birds through the winter and especially late winter period. I love putting this in because we all want blueberries ourselves, but blueberry is one of the most overlooked landscaping uh, species in my view. Yes, they need a little bit of uh, soil amendment sometimes, but the fall colors are really wonderful. And the berries, if you're not eating them, the birds will be. And chances are the birds will get them before you do. Uh, this is one that's native here along the shore of Lake Erie, um, more typical along the Atlantic coast. But I put this in because uh, Northern Bayberry produces these little gray berries on the female plants for this little species here. And this wonderful story of how important plant location is for birds is that in the Christmas bird count we do in Norfolk County, here along the shoreline, the Turkey Point bog, which has the biggest population of uh, northern bayberry, is also, which this species of yellow warbler feeds on in winter, is the only really guaranteed site where you're going to pick up a small overwintering population of this warbler in southern Ontario. They found it, they're going to stay. And lastly, um, some of the seeded plants again, not just a reminder not to deadhead that we really need to uh, keep these stocks going. Usually they're pretty well stripped by February, March, so an early spring cleanup works. But all the small seeded uh, prairie plants are really vitally important to song, uh, songbirds, uh, sparrows, overwintering sparrows, uh, particularly those from further north, uh, really relish those small seeds on all of these plants. And lastly, the butterflies are going through right now, enjoying the asters and the seeds of these, of course, will feed the birds a little later on. And with that, I do wanna thank you. Um, that was a lot of information to get through, uh, but um, hope uh, you're thinking a little differently about the plant selection for birds. Uh, think about what they're attracted to and I'm happy to answer any questions if there's time. Hi there, my name's Donna Lang and um... I'm a board member of NAMPS and I'm going to do the Q&A. Um, I just wanted to say, Kevin, uh, Gregor, Beck, your partner, the photographs are absolutely spectacular. Thank you. Just awesome. Thank you. Thank it was a joy to look at all the color, color and the <laughs> vibrancy. So um, perhaps people can unmute themselves when I call up their name. Uh, the first question is coming from Narsing. Um, how can you plant a garden like that on a budget? Can you give us a little bit of a color commentary on specifically what, what you're referring to? How that, big is your garden that you want to do, et cetera? Yeah, that is a really good question. Um, one of the things that I should have mentioned when I showed those earlier gardens that looked really impressive, um, if you're working on a budget, those gardens were planted with what many of you may know, we call plugs, little seedlings of native plants that are quite uh, cost effective. Um, and we were astonished because we've done this before. We know there's going to be a good quick uh, result in how quickly things will grow, but how quickly they in fact did grow in these particular cases. So you can start out with quite small plant material. And if you're nurturing it, I think you'll be astonished sometimes at how quickly they'll take off, especially for a pollinator garden and perennials. Trees are another matter. They take a little bit longer. So, um, uh, you know, you may have to start out a little bit smaller, but most backyards, you're not going to be able to, or front yards, you're not going to be able to put a lot of trees in. So you're only looking at picking a few key specimens and maybe you can go a bit larger. Um, if, if the other thing I like to encourage people is, go in stages, take your time. You don't have to, you don't have to do it all at once. Um, this is something that you really begin to build, see what's working for you, see how you go. And if you put some native species in and want to expand later on, you can collect seed. You can take divisions and cuttings from your own plants to help with that cost factor down the road. So there's a number of ways of looking at um, trying to save costs. The other, the, the one thing I would really highly recommend though, is that you try and have an overall plan for the garden so that when you do have an opportunity to acquire plants, you have a sense of where they're going to go and aren't sitting with plants and wondering, now what do I do with them? Um, so you actually can get that sort of design in place and that plan in place 
and then over time you can ins do the installation and build it. Uh, so Narsing, does that answer your question? Can you unmute yourself? Yes, sorry, uh, it's Narsing's wife, Carolyn. And yes, that was very helpful. Thank you so much, Kevin. Oh, you're welcome. I like the idea of being able to do it in stages um, because it's more affordable, but also just from a time perspective, you can uh, nurture it um, over you know, two or three or many years. That's a, it, it is a really good point. I mean, it's also, I don't like it when people take on a little too much and then get discouraged because maybe it, it, they aren't able to have the time to quite keep it up. And by doing it in stages, once plants get well established, there's usually less weeding to do and so forth. But if you're doing a large thing all at once, you do have to spend a fair bit of time where you're gonna have invasives coming in or some aggressive individuals taking over and limiting your diversity. So building it in stages to what your time permits is very practical. Great, now we have, um, this is a typical computer name here, iPad 2 <laughs> with a question. I find it difficult to figure out what native plants are specific to my area. How do I drill down and get info about what's suitable? And then the person is saying, uh, this may be answered by birdgardens.ca question mark. Well, I was going to say, uh, start with birdscanada.ca. It is on an eco-regional level. So you are getting plants. Uh, if you go through the process, that's pretty straightforward. Um, knowing the conditions of your yard, checking those off and um, uh, having and doing so obviously within the zone that you would have to click on, it will produce a list of plants. And if you are looking for a tree, for example, you would then, you can click tree and it will just show you the trees. If you're looking for uh, a prairie garden and want all the perennials, you can, you can do that. So it will begin creating a list for you. And that list you can, um, do, oh, I'm, I'm told it's birdgardens.ca. I may have said it wrong. Um, it's good to have an audience in the backdrop. Uh, so, so that website will be a resource to begin with. And, okay, uh, that's great. Can somebody put that can in I the ask, chat box for us? Question. Can I ask, I don't know how narrow it gets. You know, I live in kind of Northwest Toronto and I know that, you know, a native plant could be, I don't know how much, how precise I should be about what really originally grew in that part of Ontario or even Southern Ontario, yep. because it might've been, it might be okay, like 200 miles from here, you know? Uh, no, that's, a, and that's a really, really good point. So and I can't find that information, you know, about, because I've yep. people tell me, oh no, that's not good for here specifically. And yep. I'm not talking about, you know, um, climate or something like that. I just mean that it wouldn't have been here, like, you know, do you well, know what I mean? The, yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. So the resource can take you part way. Uh, the bird regions uh, will at least sort of put you all in a similar climatic condition. So yeah. the full plants are suitable for that. And then you need to begin matching, knowing what your own yard conditions are for plants yeah. that are suitable. Once you get that list, you may need to do, and I do encourage most of my clients and customers, um, if they want to be doing some of that on their own, to do a little bit of their own research about that kind, by that point, that kind of soil condition or that kind of habitat condition for your area. So uh, there is a little bit of sleuthing involved. There are many other resources, some of the local um, uh, 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 naturalist groups will have uh, resources available. Um, Within the garden, um, within that website, we do also have a long list of other resources available uh, that are more specific to regions that we've uh, tagged there that you could maybe find that would be suitable for your part of uh, Northwestern Ontario, uh, Toronto. Um, it's hard because even within an area like you're in, whether you were in a drier or wetter or on yeah. an area with slope, there's gonna be variation. And so we need to respect that and it's really hard to get one resource that can answer all those questions. So it's nice to have a resource that narrows it down, but to take it that last step, you may have to do a little bit of uh, additional research. Sure, thanks very much. Great okay. presentation. Thank you. And if anybody else has any other ideas about uh, 
how to create filters for what you're looking for for your specific uh, area, please just put them in the chat box. We'd appreciate it. And I should just remind people, I heard you at the beginning that uh, there's a plant sale you guys are doing for all those people who need plants for your new garden. Um, and I think you said it closed uh, this Sunday. So I, I might just throw in that our own Branford Gardeners are doing an online sale as well that ends a week later with pickups in Cambridge, Brantford, and here in Norfolk. So I'm not overstepping your area, but uh, if there's viewers who are beyond that, um, they can go online to the Brantford Master Gardener site and there's an online order form there too of only native plants. That's great. And uh, we're coming to Brantford in the springtime, so look out. <laughs> Uh-oh. Um, and so getting back to, yeah, the plant sale. So uh, there's, Toronto and then Hamilton for the very first time. So if any of you live in the Hamilton area, uh, we're really happy to be launching our pilot there and we will be repeating in the springtime. We've already got lots of orders, so we're really happy. That's um, great, great to hear. Yeah, yay native plants. So there is a question, Olga, um, you had asked a question um, and I think, I think people answered you and told you what- Oh, did you? Oh, uh... Around, no, I don't see the answer. Sorry, where is the answer? Okay, I saw some answers um, and I thought they were related to your question. So why don't you ask your question again so that we can answer it? No, my question was about American uh, mountain ash tree, like Sorbus Americana. I cannot seem to find it anywhere. I really want to find it, but everybody sells European ash trees. It's a, it's a good question. Um, I just sold out this morning, if you can imagine. I sold my last one yeah, um, for, the, for the year. Um, normally, normally I have some. Um, it, uh, I don't know where you're located, if it's Toronto. I'm in Brampton, uh, in Brampton but I can drive uh, up to 100 kilometers easy, no problem. Yeah. Uh, in the spring, um, I was told that uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, is, it, is it Northland Nurseries, the one that sells all the pots the same price? they were carrying American mountain ash. And um, I went and uh, had a look and it, it was it was American mountain ash. Sometimes I worry that some of the nurseries will sell something and it's- Did get, uh, What is the name for the nursery you said? Uh, it's, I, I think it's Northland. Northland, okay, thank you. It's, it's, Olga, it's, 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 water, it's uh, north of Hamilton, just- uh, Okay. Yeah. Olga, if you uh -huh. will put your email in the chat box, then okay. one of the- people on the NAMPS board will get back to you. They'll do a bit of research to try to help you. So um, I have a question and we have two more questions. My question is, uh, let's say I want to, um, I want to have cardinals and I'm trying to find out what species, native species I should be planning to attract that kind of bird. Is there a website that allows you to filter by bird and then by native species in that order? Um, not, not to that level of um, sort of fine tuning. Um, I'm just trying to think of other resources. Within the, the search engine that we talked about under um, birdgardens.ca, you can look at birds that like seeds, for example, and then uh, the plants in your region that would support that, but not cardinal specific. Um, at this point, um, you, you, I, I, we've, I've looked at, a, we looked at a lot of different databases and some will usually do bird groups like that, but it's rare that we, well, we didn't find any that just sort of said, you know, you can search by a bird species to then find all the plants that would then be suitable for whatever region you were in living in at that point. Um, so I don't think that exists, or at least we didn't come across it. So here's a great idea for you, Kevin. There's obviously a gap there. Um, because you can go on obviously, and, and you know, if you want to attract a certain type of butterfly, uh, you can drill down to what type of native plants, uh, you know, yeah. like that or hosts or the same thing, you know, which, um, which native plants are host to bees or, or other uh, insects? It's interesting. So it's a, yeah, it's interesting you say that because there's really good resources available for uh, uh, insects 
uh, far more so. And I think it's in part because birds are typically within what they will do somewhat more general. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's it, many of them aren't as specific to a plant. They like groups of plants and there are certain plants at a particular time of the year they'll really go for. But over the course of the year, it, uh, they're much more varied in their diet. Yeah, so tell us a little bit more about that. So um, they're not as particular in terms of, you know, wanting a specific native species, um, you know, and in, in, in terms of the nectar, the food, um, but they will then sort by whether they like insects versus fruit versus food, basically. They're sorting by food type by the sounds of it. Yeah, and there's, they, yes, that's correct. And some of them switch through the year as to what that food group is. So for example, we mentioned um, vireos and species like that who will often sort of cross things. They'll, they'll, be, they'll have a stage of their life where they're quite actively seeking insects. And then post-breeding, they'll move on to, uh, especially for migration, mixing that and adding considerably to that in terms of some of the uh, berries that you find on shrubs and so forth. So it will depend in part for some of these species, what time of year you're going, um, you're looking at. And, and the thing with planning for that is that you're really trying to create, I, I, I always say with birds, you're trying to create a natural uh, assemblage of plants that will benefit birds at different times. It's rare a backyard can support all of what a bird needs in one yard. And that was the idea of that neighborhood effect. Uh, but you can definitely contribute to that and make a big difference by having species that they will use at the point they need. And they will find them. Um, they're, they're remarkably um, good at seeking out some of the plant species they need at that point in their life cycle to succeed. So it's not a very clear question. It's in, like in biology, some of these things are, it's not that if you have this, you'll definitely have this um, with birds. Uh, you have a better chance and a much better probability of attracting them at that window of, of the year when they're needing it. Donna, a few more questions that came in. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if, if you've seen them yet. Um, can I can I can I field uh, lob lob the, the next one to Kevin? Please do. Okay, um, this one is from Marnie. It's when we don't we deadhead. Will the plant spread like wild in the spring? I for some reason I missed part. Could you just repeat it? I just missed part of it. <laughs> If you don't deadhead the plants um, when they, you know, in the in the uh, when they finished flowering, will they spread like wild in the spring? My experience with this is just goldenrod is does that. Oh yeah, and some of and and some of the species are pretty aggressive, and we manage them pretty carefully, or we don't put them in. Uh, so your point <laughs> is the short answer is yes. Some of the species that are aggressive by nature, if you don't deadhead them you will get spread and you have to weigh that in as to whether that's going to be helpful to the garden or not. Um, some species of goldenrod, uh, certainly Canada goldenrod is both aggressive uh, with underground runners as well as seeding in um, whether or not it's even initially growing in your garden, you may get that coming in from adjacent areas. So some species are, um, and uh, again, you may wanna learn a little bit about those species. Uh, that's our warning around cup plant can be like that on really happy sites for it, which are typically rich, moist sites. Um, goldenrod is, uh, uh, Canada goldenrod is one I'd be concerned about, but we often plant lots of other clumping species of goldenrod without that kind of situation arising. So plant selection and learning a bit about the individual plants you're about to put in is really critical. Um, echinacea, uh, some of those species can certainly spread around a bit, um, but uh, if you want to weed a few of them out, we often do. Uh, again, it depends how successful the garden has been in terms of other species coming and how much of the seed they eat. Uh, so it's a bit of a risk I guess you take. Um, uh, part of our philosophy with a lot of these gardens is that they are sort of meant to change a bit over time and there'll be slight changes in numbers of individual plants. Some will be more um, 
plentiful down the road. Others may start to wink out a little bit, but you don't want massive changes if you want to maintain the diversity. So you do have to pay attention to that, uh, that can sort of the deadheading issue in terms of what might turn into a real problem if you don't. Thank you. It's um, a, it, so, sorry, I feel like the answers are kind of, you know, good Canadian <laughs> on, on, on that fence line, but I'm trying to be honest. Um. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, we have a question from Pat G. And that question is, we're pulling English ivy and invasives, and Pat would like suggestions for any native fast growing ground cover alternatives to English ivy. Uh, good luck with English ivy, you're doing a good thing. Um, it's challenging. Uh, what we have been putting in uh, at the base of, um, for the ground cover in our gardens, um, and some of these can, spread and we're okay with that. We find most perennials will come up through them, but do be careful if you do have a patch of something you don't want them to go into. So uh, our native wild strawberries can be really great. Not only do they provide some food for critters and birds alike, but uh, they, they are very tough ground covers. Um, most things will come up through them. So it's not a restrictive uh, plant in that way. Uh, there's barren strawberry, which is a different uh, genus of species, uh, a species um, that is also good in the shade. If it's a little more shaded, um, we love foam flower is another great plant that has, uh, we've really found that to be a wonderful mix in with things like wild ginger and um, other native uh, woodland species, ferns, uh, some of the marginal ferns and things like that that come up, uh, it will, they will it will not restrict them from performing well too. So it's a great ground cover in that way. So that's foam flower. Those are three, strawberry, barren strawberry and foam flower are three good ground covers. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Tim Mack, which is how do you keep deer and rabbits from eating seedlings? Um, you yell at them a lot. Uh, no, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Um, it's, it's very challenging. And right now we have uh, a very high population phase for Eastern cottontail throughout most of Southern Ontario. We seem to be at a level that no one's seen in about 15 years. So we are seeing a fair bit of damage from cottontails. Um, deer is increasingly becoming a similar issue in many areas, including right into downtown Toronto and the ravines. Um, our only true solution after many, many attempts is to exclude them uh, in winter. So we usually start uh, around um, garden areas that we wanna protect plants in, and it's usually the woodies that we have the most trouble with, although in deer will take on a lot of the other stuff in the summer. But uh, it, for winter protection, at least, we put around um, uh, cage wire uh, for, uh, things like blueberries and other shrubs that they really seem to like. And usually we try to have it in place by mid-November when they seem to change their diet over to being more focused on the woodies. For deer, if you have a big deer problem and, um, and, and uh, they tend to be more problematic in the winter, uh, what we often now use to great effect is snow fencing, but the old wooden slatted form, which stands about three and a half or four feet high. Yes, they could easily jump it. They're too lazy most of the time. Uh, we've rarely had a breach of that. So the nice thing about it is, uh, unlike the sort of bright colored plastic stuff that breaks down or the rabbits will chew through, um, you can put that wooden fence up. It comes in 50 foot rolls and you can use it year after year after year if you store it. And it doesn't look quite as ugly in my view as many of the plastic products. In, we don't really need a lot more plastic in the world. Um, we don't need a lot of other things, but it does, uh, that snow fencing can look quite nice in a garden and seems to be very effective. You have to surround that bed, but 50 feet enables you to surround some fairly large areas or a couple of rolls of it. And the fact that it keeps nicely year to year, if you store it in a dry garage or something for the summer, means that you have a one-time investment that'll last quite a while. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Kevin, I think we've, um, we've, we've basically come to the end of our time. There's a few more questions, but we're, we're going to close this off and see if we can ask you those questions later separately that we can send out to the people who asked them. Um, thank you very much for doing this terrifically interesting presentation. Um, for me in particular, it's great to have a talk that, that is showcasing not just pollinators because everybody, as you say, talks about pollinators, but about how to how to have a garden that attracts birds, which are just as important. Um, and it was also a beautiful presentation with, with those wonderful photographs for, that you and, and Gregor took. So thank you very much. Um, this has been okay. really great. Great, and our Zoom worked, so even better. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much, this was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all the participants as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.